of you do what? Deceive you. Neither hearken to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. You know what that tells me? That tells me the devil can visit you in the night and try to get you persuaded by getting you to dream or causing certain things to happen in your life. Because the reality is, in the natural sense, whether you know this or not, you can literally watch a certain thing or listen to a certain thing right before you go to bed, and then you go dreaming about whatever it was you was watching or listening to. And that is just a little thing to help you understand that in the natural, there are things that can affect your thinking that will make you, to cause you, as the Bible talking about causing to dream certain things. And the Lord was telling them, he said, don't pay, pay attention to all these false prophets and, and some of these dreams that you're being caused to dream. And I'll tell you why. He says, for thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you. Ain't that a promise from God? And perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. Talking about God's deliverance out of this place. In verse number 11, I want to springboard and I want to launch out from this text. I really want you to listen to this. For I know, this is God talking, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of what? Peace, not of evil. To give you an expected end. I want to read that again because there are a lot of people that are going through a lot of difficulties. Yes, it'd be a wonderful memory verse. There's a lot of people going through a lot of difficulties, and you need to get this in your spiritual DNA. Listen, God says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Like God saying, don't try to tell me, don't put words in my mouth. I know what I think about you. He says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. In other words, God is saying, I got a plan for you. Somebody say a plan. I got a plan. Say it again, a plan. I have a plan for you and expect it in. Then shall ye call upon me and ye shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all of your heart. You see, there's there's something going on here. It's not just God doing something. It's God's people doing something. And, and, And in light of that, God is moving. And then he says in verse number 13, Ye shall seek me, find me, when you search for me with all of your heart. Verse 14, And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Again, what God was saying, the place that I'm going to take you to is the place you came from. You came out of a place that you were supposed to be. They went into Babylonian captivity. And because of their rebellion, they ended up there. But God is sending them a message here and says, after 70 years have been completed, I'm coming for you. And if you do the right thing, I'm taking you out of here and I'm taking you back where you belong. Somebody say, take me back where I belong, Lord. Amen. With the Lord's help tonight, I'm going to preach something that I've never preached before. And I want to preach to the church and those folks that are online tonight something that I really believe is going to help somebody on my future forecast. Never preach this. This is brand new. I want you to raise your hand to the Lord and ask God to have his will and way. Father, tonight we know that you're the author and the finisher of our faith. I'm praying tonight, God, that you will add the anointing that makes preaching worth listening to. I pray tonight, God, that hearts will fall under conviction. Our lives will be challenged. Lord, let the word come across clearly spoken and clearly understood. Let those that hear it be challenged and convicted and desire to pray and to talk to you and to take action. Lord, I pray they'll take action as a result And everyone can say, man, you can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Preaching tonight on my future forecast. My future forecast. 
Have you ever become so weak in your life before that your struggles got to you and in your weakness you began to wonder if God truly wanted what was best for you? Have you ever been in a place before, and I came to talk to you tonight. Have you ever been in a place before where that you got so weak and you struggled and you're so frustrated and it seemed like the guy over there on the right-hand side, he's making more money and you can't seem to make a dollar. And here you are, that guy just bought a new vehicle and your, yours is falling apart. Or you look across the street and that church down the road, they're growing by leaps and bounds and you keep losing people. Or maybe you're in a place where it seemed like you're constantly in the doctor and that fellow over there, his health seemed like it's better than it's ever been and he's 10 years older than you. And you're just sitting back wondering, God, do you, and I'm just telling you, I know that it ain't spiritual and I know we probably shouldn't think like this, but in the weakness of our flesh, there are times that we, we wonder to ourselves, God, do you really want what's best for me? Now, you may not even say that, but in your flesh you feel a little down and beside yourself because I don't understand because if I'd have been 15 years old and you'd have told me that I'd be where I'm at right now, I'd have been really disappointed with the outcome, God. I don't, I don't, I never would have thought I'd be right here going through what I'm going through right now. No, I'm talking to somebody. You see, I'm sure that after many years that God's people spent in Babylonian captivity, that they had moments where they wanted if God really cared and God truly wanted what was best for them. What you have to understand tonight is the fact that not everybody that was in there had sinned and rebelled against God and caused them to be in Babylonian captivity. Now, how is that possible, Brother Myers? Well, you have to understand they were there for 70 years, and yes, there were forefathers, grandparents, and parents that sinned against God. And as a result, God moved, and God's swift hand of judgment came because of their rebellion, and they ended up in Babylonian captivity. But in the space of 70 years, there's a lot of people born during that time. So there is another generation that is, for all intents and purposes, they're innocent of the thing, the charge that would have put them in Babylonian captivity to begin with. And I've got to wonder to myself if there were ever days that the, that the next generation said, Lord, now I didn't do anything to deserve this. And I don't understand, you know, we sit around the campfire and we hear old stories about God moving in the past and God delivering and God doing this and that. And here we are in Babylon in captivity and I'm an innocent man. I didn't do nothing. I don't deserve to be where I'm at. Have you ever wondered to yourself, why am I going through this? I don't feel like I've done anything. I've tried to serve the Lord and I've tried to do right by God. Why does it seem like that my future seems to be marred by somebody else's foolish decision? I want to tell you tonight, sometimes we end up in a place of our life that we don't want to be in and it's not directly because of what we did it could very well be times uh, that somebody else did something that caused a chain of events that put us in that place. Have you ever gone through anything like that before? You lost a job because they did something or you were standing in the line and somebody else was talking in line and you got yanked and put at the back of the line because somebody else was talking to you and they just took it for granted that maybe you were guilty too. But let me tell you something, folks. Life is not always fair, and if you agree, say amen. Now, if you don't agree with that, you must be about five years old and had to live very long. But let me tell you, if you've lived very long, you know that life is not always fair. Come on and say amen to me tonight. I came to preach to you. You see, there may be many guilty people that have caused themselves to be put there, but not everybody is like that. Some folk are not directly guilty. And here they are. They're in Babylonian captivity. And I can only imagine that they were so anxious to get a word from God that they were given ear to false prophets. Now what I like in that too today is the people that will listen to somebody that ain't even saved. The people that will pick up the phone and call somebody. Girl, what do you think about this? And Oh, they'll talk to that guy on the job and they'll talk to him and them and there and whoever and they'll get 
on TV and watch Oprah and see what she got to say about it. And, and I mean, they want to know what Dr. Phil got to say about it and everything else. And they're going to people that ain't even saved and want to know what their opinion is on a matter. And you see, in this generation, there were people that I can only imagine that were anxious to get a word from God. Here they've been in this captivity under the whip of the taskmaster for so long and they've had to deal with the brunt and the blow that has been dealt to them and a hand maybe that some of them felt was unfair. But irregardless, they are there and they've got to pay the penalty and the price of whatever is coming down the pipeline. And so we see them in this place and we know that in the Bible that God has told them not to give ear to the false prophets. Don't listen to them because they're going to mislead you to think that there's peace coming when there's no peace. They're going to mislead you to think that this is a result of something else. You've got to tune everything out that is not of God and you got to tune in the voice of God. Now I can't emphasize enough to you how important that is because in the moment when you're going through it and you just got a bad doctor's diagnosis or you just got fired from your job or you just got in an argument with somebody you love and they act like they're never going to talk to you again or you find out that the church folk you've been churching with uh, have been talking about you or you find out something that just blows you out of the water in the very moment, in the very instant in that moment, your mind will race and you, even your own mind will get carried away and you'll begin to question everything you've ever stood for and if I'm not preaching the truth, come on now, I'm going to tell you, you'll begin to wonder and question a lot of things about what you've seen in church. You'll be questioning how you were raised in church. You'll be questioning things you preached or heard preached in church. That's how the flesh man will work in an hour, in a moment like that. But the Lord said, don't listen to these deceiving false prophets in verse number 8. Well, then we look and we see that he goes on to tell them that this has a great deal to do with the forecast of your future. What God is trying to emphasize to them is that the message that he is giving them in Jeremiah right here, it is a future forecast of what God is about to do. You see, tonight God sent me here to help someone to understand your future forecast. There are some of you that have been wondering, you've been sitting back, you've been idle, you're frustrated about the future, you're thinking you're going to be stuck like this the rest of your life, you're feeling like that the rest of life is going to be maybe a negative downturn, but God says turn all of that foolishness off, and I want you to listen to me, the thing that I'm about to tell you have to do with the forecast that I have for you. This is not Channel 9's forecast of a tornado or Channel 6's forecast of good weather next week. This is the forecast that God says that it is going to rain when I say that it's going to rain in your future. Can someone say, Lord, send it my way tonight? But you see what he goes on to tell them has everything to do with their future. And then in verse number 10, he tells them that when these 70 years have been fulfilled, that he's going to deliver them from their captivities. In other words, God is giving them a direct promise. And God says when all of these 70 years have been completed, I don't know if that was what God decided. Like a parent that says, bend over, I'm giving you five licks and then we'll have a talk about this and it'll be over but God said when 70 years have been completed I am going to deliver you from these oppressors and here's what he says in verse number 11 that makes me think that he's like a warm hearted father who after he's just given his son a whooping uh, sits down on the corner of the bed and pulls his son over there and said now, son let me have a little talk with you and let me tell you a few things uh, and in doing so he relays the heart of the father and the very love that he has for that child. And this is what he says in verse number 11. He says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. I told you earlier it was God saying, I've got a plan for you. You see, it's easy when you're in captivity. It's easy when you're going through mess. And it's easy when everybody else looks like their life is getting 
Their life is together and mine's falling apart. Everybody else has got the high road and I got the low road. Everybody else is prospering while I'm over here struggling just to get by. And it seemed like I got a bad card or deck of cards or hand of cards in life. And it just don't make sense. But God comes along and God says, I want you to know that in the midst of all of this, you may have wondered if I wanted peace for you, but I do. You may have wondered to yourself if I cared about you, but I do. You may have wondered if I've been listening to your prayers for deliverance, but I've been listening. You may wonder if I still love you, but I do. You may wonder if anybody cares about you, but I do. You may wonder if I'm still around, and I am. You may still wonder if you're one of mine, but you still are. Let me tell you somebody, it's God coming along, sitting on the corner of the bed, pulling his child close by and saying, I know that that whooping made you think that I didn't love you anymore. This mess you've gone through, you may have questioned whether or not that I even loved you, but God said, I've got thoughts. I know my heart, God says. I've got thoughts of love for you. I've got thoughts of peace for you. And you may say, God, why am I struggling? But God said, I care about what's up ahead for you. Can somebody raise your hand and give God praise because God has a plan for us. You see, yet there is a very valuable ingredient in verses number 12 and 13 and I want you to hear me very closely I want you to pull into this you see 12 and 13 reveals the doorknob that will open the door to the future that God has forecasted for them you see God has a plan but that plan is contingent upon something I want you to hear me very well I said God's forecast for your future is contingent upon something God has already said stepped out on a limb and told them what he has got for them. But then he goes on to say that this is contingent upon something. What is it? Well, listen to verse number 12 and 13. Then ye... He's talking about them. Ye shall call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. In other words, what God is saying is I've got a future forecast and you're going to pray and you're going to seek me. But if I give you a future forecast and you don't pray and you don't seek me, then don't expect to find me and don't expect to get delivered. You can't get lost in the shuffle of everything wrong and fail to give God his due allegiance and turn your nose up at God and walk away from God in doing so you will not receive what's at the end of that race you will not receive that future forecast that God's got ahead of you amen are you feeling what I'm preaching tonight I'm feeling it praise the Lord Verse number 13 he said you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all of your heart Amen. He said, when you start searching and you do it with all of your heart, you're going to find me. See, people want God's answer. People want the forecast. People want God's plan. But they don't want to seek after it. And they don't want to do it with all their heart. They just want to sit around haphazardly. They've watched a few too many episodes of of I Dream a Genie. And they think somebody's going to rub a bottle or a lamp and poof, it's just going to happen. But God said, you better get down to prayer. And you better start seeking me. If you want answers on that job, start praying and seeking me. If you need me to move in your church, start praying and seeking me and finding me. If you need answers answers in your marriage, uh, in your relationship, get down and get busy and serious and start praying because at the end of 70 years uh, I'm going to show you that I'm still God and I still love you. Can you say amen? That's not that's not my story pastor. That, that's not me. That's the Israelites. I mean that, that's several thousand years ago and that was under the old covenant. What about us and what about, what about right now? Can I talk to you heart to heart for just a minute here? You see, there is a question that often con- that concerns us, and sometimes it even frustrates us. I'm just the type of person that I'd just rather call it like it is and just be real and honest and try to, instead of trying to beat around the bush. But there's a question that sometimes it concerns us, and sometimes, honestly, it even frustrates us. Like questions like, what does my future look like? Sometimes it frustrates you because 
You're not seeing it happen. It's not happening fast enough. It's not happening the way you thought it should. For some people, the question sounds more like, what's God's will for me? Is there anybody besides me ever wondered, God, what is your will? I mean, what do you have in store for me? What am I supposed to be doing? Especially if you're called into some level of ministry. God, what is your will for me? And others, it sounds more like this. Will it always be like this? Have you ever wondered that before? God, is it always going to be like this? Have you ever got up? You know, brush your teeth in the morning, made your cup of coffee, whatever you do when you get ready for work, and you're struggling to get in that car, and you turn it over five or ten times and it don't want to crank, and you push the brakes and it acts like it don't want to stop, and you pull up to work, barely make it on time, come in, sleep in your eyes, and you're hurting in your body, and you're pulling through the day, and you think, God, is it always going to be like this? Am I going to struggle for the rest of my life? I mean, God, help me right here. Let me tell you, there are times uh, that that question concerns and sometimes uh, it even frustrates us and if I'm preaching right say amen somebody but there's at least three components that affect the process of life's future outcome somebody say three things there's at least three components that affect your future forecast and I'm going to preach all three of these out to you the first one is God's intentional plans I don't even believe that God has thoughts of you. He thinks about you. Thoughts of peace. Thoughts of mercy and love and joy. God has intentional plans. Now everybody's got their mind about how they believe on certain things or predestination and there's thoughts of, you know, whatever about life's everyday unfolding. And I look at life like this. I know that there are things that God specifically designates and orchestrates in our life. But there are certain elements of our life that I don't know that it's like God making you go through a painful trial. There are some things that are a product of just natural, just natural outcome of the way life is. I mean, you, you could look around and say, oh, devil made my truck break down. No, you got 283,000 miles on it and you ain't changing fuel pump since you bought it. Ain't got a thing to do with the devil. But there are times that it is the devil. Come on out and you're helping me preach tonight. But God has intentional plans for you. And that is one of the components that affects the future of our forecast. And these are things that God has specifically designed for you. I mean, you have to understand tonight. It's not like God has no plans for you. That is a mind-blowing thing for some people. Some people think that they've got it on cruise and whatever happens, happens. It's not as if God's got a specific idea or plan that he's got for my life. I'm one of those that I believe that God's got an intentional, purposeful plan for your life. It is designed by God. God, something that he wants you to work for, something he wants you to see you walk in, and it's designed by God. The second component, and that element is our personal choices, the choices that stem from our own personal desires. These things are what affects our future, our choices, the things you decide to do, the things you want to do. And then the third thing is the choices of other people. These three things will affect your future forecast. God's intentional design and desire and and, and will for your life. Your choices and your desire. Your willingness and will. And third of all, the choices of other people. Because if I had to take a poll tonight, I could almost guarantee you that there are people here, there are people online, that you've gone through something that was a result of what somebody else did. You've had to suffer because of something somebody else did. There are people that have gone through car wrecks that are living in pain to this day because somebody else chose to drink and drive. There are some other people who've lived a lifetime of emotional trauma because somebody decided to give them up at childbirth. Hey man, it didn't want to be the had to foster care, whatever. And I want to tell you, that is a decision that somebody else made and put that on you. And you've had to deal with that. And so there are three components of your life that are going to affect every day your future, how things are going to turn out. It's going to have a lot to do with the way other people do stuff. It's going to have a lot to do with the way you do stuff. And it's going to have a lot to do with God. God's plan for your life, but if you let God exercise that plan in your life, 
These are three things, can you say amen, that affect everyday life. But what you and I have to understand is that any one of these three things can completely alter the outcome that we thought that we would have. For some of you, you had this dream in your mind. You know, little girls, they sit around sometimes, they read novels, they play with baby dolls, they want to grow up and be a mommy, and they want to be a wife, and, and uh, they want to have, have a house, and they want to cook dinner, and they want to, they want to be successful, and they want to be beautiful, and they, they want to be admired, and they want to be respected, and they want to be loved. They, they, they prepare themselves for this at a young age. Little boys, they, they want to grow, grow up and be strong and tough, respected, admired, valued. They want to have a place. They want to be looked up to. They want to be, they want to be looked at as a representative or a model for other people. They want to be the hero. Little boys, well, I mean, growing up in our era of generation, and some still do this, they have superheroes they look at. And they say, well, look at the Iron Man, or look at the Hulk Hogan, or whoever, or look at, you know, Incredible Hulk, or somebody else. They look up to certain figures in society, and, and they begin to prepare their mind. To, to look up to something because they want to be great in life. As a young child, they want to be looked at. They want to be the, the, the best baseball player on the team. and They want everybody to look at them and, and, and admire their talent and skill. This is what little kids want to do when, they, when they're young. But what happens is they begin to grow up and uh, things don't always turn out the way that they thought they would because any one of these two last things can Destroy or delay the plan that God has for your life. What is that, Pastor? Well, the second thing was our personal choices, and the third was the choices of other people. And the last two can either delay or destroy God's plan for our life. I want to talk to you, and I want to talk to your heart tonight. This is a message that I would preach in a camp meeting. It's Thursday night. we got a handful of people here. we got some maybe watching online. I don't know. But I would preach this in a camp meeting because I really felt this burning in my heart. It's a message that people really desperately need to hear. And you see, I, these two things may delay or destroy the plan that God has for us. And here we are. We're saying, God, we want to walk in your will. God, we want the best because I know you want the best for me. And I mean, if you talk to some people, if you got right down to it, they may not say it with their mouth, but their actions they would convey to you by their attitude that God's got it out for them. God's, he wants the worst for you. He wants you to suffer. He wants you to go through heartache and hardship. If you listen to them talk, that's about the way it sounds. And I'm not saying that to condemn anybody because I probably talked like that before in my life as well. But here's the thing about it. You have to understand why that is important because whether it's in our love life, whether it's in our career, Whether it's in our family or our ministry or more, we can easily be held prisoner outside of God's will for us because of, number one, our poor choices. The things that we chose to do and our desire. Number two, people's choices and influence over us. We can be held prisoner from that future forecast that God has for us because of our poor choices that don't turn the knob and open up the door into what God has for us. Or we can be held captive because of the choices that other people, sometimes we're yoked with, sometimes it could be family, it could be friends that are close to us. Sometimes we can be held captive because of other people's decisions. But I want to discuss those two elements. I have preached this entire message to deal with these two things. Now, I know that in the church that there are certain subjects that you may not hear preached on, and it may be a long time till you hear it again. So I want you to zero in, and I want you to listen very closely to these two specific things. Because first, if we look at our choices and our desires, I want you to know tonight that whether it is Eve's choice to eat forbidden fruit, Israel dancing around a golden calf, King David watching Bathsheba through the window of the bathroom, or Samson laying his head in Delilah's lap, 
Ephrath or Judah selling out Christ for a few, few pieces of silver. History has continually proven to us that our poor choices are the reason for much of our suffering. A lot of the reason why we go through what we go through is because we brought it on ourselves. We chose something uh, and that is why we are in the mess that we are in today. Now I don't mean to say this I don't want to come across critical, and please don't misunderstand me. I mean this in all the due respect I can. But I'm often saddened in my heart when I see men and women, especially it seems like more so women sometimes than even men, posting things on social media. Well, there's no good men out there. I just can't find no good men. Let me tell you, it, it, it can be hard to find somebody who really loves God and a righteous man. But but in some women's case, the reason they can't find a good man is because they've lowered their standard and they've let themselves become loose. And every time that they go looking for a man, they're scraping the bottom of the barrel, looking for some sorry, sorry willy somewhere. And the next thing you know, that relationship doesn't work out because you raised your dress and lowered your top and lowered your standard and went out and flaunted yourself. And yeah, you got a you got something you put the bait on the hook. And you got you an old sorry one. And when the relationship went sour, then all of a sudden there ain't no good men out there. Raise the bar up and look for somebody who's got a right life, who loves God. And if he don't come along, then it must not be God's time for the right one. Well, it's, it, 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 it's their fault. It's somebody else's fault. That's the reason why. I want to tell you something. I mean, I mean all the due respect that I can. But but every time you turn around, if you're going out there scraping the bottom of the barrel looking for it, because sometimes what let me tell you what happens to some people in their choices and why they get themselves in in relationship mess like that is because they don't see themselves of any self worth. You are not junk. You are God's child. I said you're God's child. You're not trash. Amen. Let me tell you, you ain't got to look like uh, Ivana Trump or Vanka Trump or whatever her name is. You ain't got to look like Whitney Houston. You ain't got to be the most gorgeous cover magazine woman. You are God's child. You ain't got to be GQ handsome. You are God's child. You are not junk. And when you sell yourself out for the cheapest thing that goes, you're going to get a cheap experience. Well, I can't seem to find nobody. Let me go to the bar. Let me go to the nightclub. Let me go, let me go down to the gay you know, bar down there. and I mean, come on now. Let me go down to the crack house and let me find me one. Surely there'll be somebody that'll have me. Surely there'll be somebody that'll have me. But you got to know that you got some self-worth. Well, that don't sound humble, and I don't want to put myself out there. I'm not talking about being prideful, but I want to preach to something right here. We have been raised up with this mentality that if you have any confidence that God has made you to be something of value, that you're not allowed to act or think like that. Let me tell you something. That doesn't mean you're not humble. That means you know where you came from, and you know you belong to God, and God don't make junk. I may not be as pretty as her, or as handsome as him or as wealthy as them but I'm a somebody and I've got value when you start carrying yourself like that you're going to see different doors open come on now and say amen Hey, man, oh, pastor, you don't know what you're talking about. Yes, I do. I've been around. I've seen a lot in my life. I've, I've, been, I've dealt with a lot of people in these situations. And I can tell you that it's not just David and Bathsheba and Israel dancing around a golden calf and, and Samson in the lap of Delilah or Judas selling out Christ. There are prisons in America and institutions that are filled with people who put themselves there because of choices. And you know what surprises me? It's as if we've raised up a generation to blame everything and every, everybody. You talk to a lot of these people who are incarcerated, and their attitude is, it's the institution that put me here. It's the government's fault. It's the police force's fault. Well, I got news for you. Quit committing crimes and take responsibility for your choices, and a lot of the mess that goes on wouldn't go on. 
You ain't got to worry about being face planted in a cell somewhere because you acted a fool. If you don't act a fool and you don't get arrested for doing something you shouldn't have done. Let me tell you something, fool. You've got to change your choices. If you'll stop doing foolish, you'll stop having a foolish outcome. You are a product of your choices. If you choose to do wrong, you can't expect to have right. Am I preaching all right, somebody? I mean, I know this ain't popular and some people have played the victim so long they don't like that kind of preaching. But I didn't come to flower nobody's fancy. I'm just going to tell you right here tonight is that the reason why a lot of people have the attitude they have that stinks is because they think everybody's responsible for everything and they play no part in the, in the deal. They will never experience real change until they will accept what they have and the role of what they've done. Say amen to me. You see... These, these are things that I realize that as I begin to think that I consider people like Jonah are going into the opposite direction of God's plan. There, there are people tonight that are a lot like Jonah. God's trying to get you to go this way. but They're going the opposite way of God's plan. These choices will cause you to, be, to end up in the whale's belly. These choices will end up like Gehazi, who mischievously went after Naaman and got the, the material things that the man of God said, no, I, I won't receive. And you know what? Gehazi ended up with leprosy. His choice led him to that place. You remember David? King David, I see David laying over his son Absalom's casket. And the word of God, he says, Absalom, Absalom, my son Absalom. He's grieved to see the death of his own son. But in the back of his mind, he knows that his choices brought about a curse upon his family lineage, his choices. Judas takes the money and he throws it on the floor. You can hear the coins possibly roll across the floor. And he goes out and he hangs himself. Choices. I said choices. Ananias and Sapphira stand before the man of God and they held back a part of the money and lied to the Holy Ghost and God dropped them dead. Bam, just like that. Choices. Well, it was my attorney's fault. It was a real estate agent's fault. It was a pastor's fault. That church I came from, they hurt my feelings. It's their fault. Take some responsibility for your choices if you ever want to come out of Babylonian captivity and see that God help you. You cannot get forgiveness and mercy like God can offer without a broken and a contrite spirit. Am I still preaching all right, somebody? If I'm preaching too long, wave at me and I'll hush. Amen. But backsliders who are wasting precious time and talents comes to mind when I think about Jonah. I started thinking to myself tonight. You follow what I'm saying. Jonah ran the other way. If Jonah wouldn't got, hadn't got right and hadn't gone to Nineveh and had one of the greatest revivals recorded in the history of the Bible, I think it was over 600,000 people who turned back to God. If the man of God who failed God would not have turned around, this great revival would have never happened in Nineveh. That got me thinking, what about the backsliders? What about the people who, that is, who have turned their back on God tonight? Some of them can sing. Some of them know the Bible. Some of them are great teachers when they're in the church doing the Lord's work. Some of them have been great workers in the altar. Some of them have great talents and gifts that God has given them. And every 
time, every moment, every second that ticks on the clock, every minute that passes, every hour that passes, every day, every month, every year that passes while they're running from God, there's a soul somewhere that they never sang to. There's a family somewhere that they never impacted. There's a heart and a soul somewhere that never got touched by the love of God because of the fact that they are running from God. Don't tell me it's not serious. Because when a backslider runs from God, when a backslider stays gone, especially when they've been called into ministry and they've got talents and gifts that they could use for God, think of all the souls that they never reached and they're falling away. Think of all the lives that could have been changed. Think of all the camp meetings that could have sang or preached in. Choices. Choices. Somebody say, help me and help my family tonight. You and I have got to stop thinking that if God wants something to happen, that he's just going to make it happen regardless. I want you to see tonight that that kind of thinking can cause us to hijack God's forecast for us. When we start thinking, well, if God wants it to happen, you know, it's just... Man, it's just going to happen. You know, I've I got some things I want to do with my life. and Well, how's that true? Well, you see, God did not want his people to just sit around and wait for the 70 years to, to come to an end. God said, you're going to seek for me, and you're going to find me. You're going to look for me, and I'm going to answer. You're going to worship me, going to praise me, going to fall after me, and I'm going to deliver you. You know what God was saying? God was saying, you're going to do something, you're going to move, and I'm going to move because you chose. Why is that important? Because God had already forecast a positive future for them, but he also goes on to say, you're going to do something, and I'm going to move as a result. What that tells me is that God can forecast a beautiful future. He's got something laid out that he's going to do in your life, but you can hijack that or delay or destroy that thing that God had planned for you because of your choices. You're aggravated. You're mad at God. I feel that in my spirit. There's somebody watching right now, maybe after the fact, and you're mad at God. You haven't come right out and said you're mad at God, but if you get right down to it, there's some bitterness on the inside. How could you let this happen to me? You're angry. You're bitter. And you've been carrying those feelings. Sometimes you try to pray over it, just can't seem to get shook free of it. I'm going to tell you something tonight. You've got to stop thinking that it's just going to happen. Seventy years are going to pass. It's just going to fall in my lap. One day I'm going to pull up to McDonald's and the will of God is just going to fall in my lap, you know. I'm going to go up to Walmart, go parking in the parking spot, get out. Boom, all of a sudden I'm going to run into the right person and the will of God is going to unfold just like that. I'm not telling you that it can't, but it's not going to happen if you're not doing what you're supposed to do. Come on and say amen to me. I, this secondly, I've got, I, you bear with me a little while. Hopefully I haven't been preaching too long, but there's a second part of this. These are, these are two important things. The, first of all, the things that we choose to do. And secondly, the things that other people choose to do. And I want to look secondly at the them. The first part is the us. This part is the them. And in looking at them, the second element that hinders, delays, and destroys our future is other people. Specifically, other people's choices, which we cannot always change. We can't always change what people are going to do. You may go to work for somebody who gets involved in something, and you go down with them, and you had no idea. You may be friends with somebody, get in the car with them, and they pull up at the bank and rob the bank, and there you are, an accessory. And you didn't have no plan of doing that, but somebody else's foolishness drags you into their mess and you suffer the rest of your life or for many years because of what somebody else decided to do and it's not fair it's not your fault you didn't do it may not have had a thing to do with these are other people's choices and sometimes we cannot always change what other people do but there's another part of this that the holy ghost led me to preach tonight i've never preached this before and that is other people's opinion and influence which can change our forecasted future. 
Can I preach to you for a few more minutes? What are you trying to tell us tonight? What I'm telling you is, is that there are some people in our lives that have so much power and they have so much influence that whatever they think is gold. Can you make it real for me? Let, let me try to make it real. Well, because Aunt Lucy, she's been in church all her life, used to play the organ for the church of God up and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, or Uncle Steve, you know, he traveled in a tent and preached the gospel. And he thinks this ain't the will of God for my life. And I've always looked up to Uncle Steve or I've always looked at Aunt Doris and I've got a lot of confidence in them and they don't feel like it's God's will for me to sing. They told me the other day that I can't sing. There are people that you will let because you have, they have a strong influence in your life. There are people that, that may have a, a power over you without even you realizing it and you let people dictate the forecast of your future. Because they don't agree with it. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to say? Can you make it real? It's kind of like this. I began to wonder to myself. I wonder just how many preachers that God called, they felt called, that never stepped out because of some person that they knew that they had a lot of confidence to say, oh, you ain't cut out for that. You, you know, stick to doing something else. You ain't no preacher. Or maybe it's somebody that never picked up an instrument and learned how to play because somebody else said, oh, that ain't for you. Or your, your cousin, you know, they play the drums so much better than you. Don't even bother. You know, you, you just, that's not in you. You know, we don't have no drum players in our family, so you ain't cut out for that. You can't let what everybody else thinks about you or opinion or influence dictate the forecast of your future. Let me tell you, you may be married to somebody right now who don't think that you should try to serve the Lord or you shouldn't go to church that much. Or you shouldn't be that faithful. You shouldn't pay your tithes. Uh, you got to be really careful that you don't let other people's opinion dictate your future forecast that God has planned for you. You might be the world's greatest preacher. Let me tell you, if you'd heard the first sermon I ever preached, you'd have probably said, my Lord, have mercy. That boy ain't even called to preach. Uh, let me tell you something. If you'd have heard that, you'd have probably thought that. Some probably still think it, but that's all right. I know that I'm called. And I stepped out by faith. Uh, I picked up the guitar and brother Steve Johnson he started trying to teach man to play a 12 string guitar I'll never forget the first few times I picked up a guitar I thought man this ain't for me my fingers are too fat or something's wrong here this ain't working this is not working I'm not cut out to play the guitar this is not my thing now if I would have had like some people some of Job's friends yeah, but uh, uh, Brother Joe, uh, you know, I, I don't think I'd, you should try the drums. You should try the drums. You really should. If I'd have had somebody like that, all those times I took that flat top guitar that I, I don't play fancy. I, I play just enough to get by. But all the times that I took that guitar in the jail and played it and watched hot tears stream down the faces of men, grown men that were incarcerated, amen, moaning, groaning, and crying because of the sins and the conviction, I'd have never saw it. I'd have never saw the day that I took that guitar with me and Sister Myers to a boy's home where that we sat around a campfire with over 45 young boys who had gotten in trouble and they sat around that fire that night. We weren't supposed to be allowed to preach Amen. Because of the doctrinal issues. But they said, you can sing. I brought that guitar and we sat around that fire that night. We began to sing. And guess what? That night, several young boys raised their hand and said they wanted to accept Christ into their lives. Now, what if I'd have said somewhere along the way, your opinion of whether or not I might have played the guitar? You don't let what other people think about you. Let me tell you, if they got to live your life and they got to go home and sleep on your bed and they've got to deal with your circumstances, then let and run their mouth but you live the life that God called you to live otherwise you're going to let other people destroy your future forecast well I see you you could put you you'll probably be a real good street preacher but I don't think I'd ever don't ever try jail ministry that probably ain't your thing and you know don't try to nursing home ministry 
you know, maybe you should just stick to the food bank ministry. If you let other people's influence over you, you will live your life miserable beneath the forecast that God has for you. So now, Pastor, can you prove that biblically? Do you remember I mentioned Samson? Samson is a man who has let the influence of a beautiful woman cause him to lose his marbles, and he lays his head in her lap, and he tells her the secret of his power. Her influence over his life caused him to throw away the forecast for his future. Thank God at the very tail end he was able to pull the the pieces together. But I want you to know God has a forecasted plan for your life. And if you're not mindful, you'll let what somebody else thinks about it ruin your chances. I know somebody right now, I've got to preach this out because I know there's somebody that's listening. I have somebody in my family that I love dearly. And it breaks my heart because... It's almost as if they can't think for themselves. If somebody else they know don't agree with something, well, then they have to not agree as well. And if there's a change, they have to call somebody else to get their approval or what they think about it. But see, when you're following the plan of God, I I don't need to call 15 different people because they're not the one that I... Listen, if I find some, If I was single and I just met somebody... I don't need to call 15 other people because then 15 other people ain't going home to live with us. I better get get before God and I better know whether it's God's forecasted plan for my life. Not what Henry thinks about it, not what Susie Q thinks about it, but what God has to say about it. I better know for myself. I want to stop and I'm going to say something to you. When you know that God has directed you in something, I don't care who's got influence, who's got power over your life, there will come a place in your life where you're like, look, you may reject me, you may talk about me, y'all going to say a lot of stuff about me, but it don't make no difference no more. Because you ain't, got, you ain't the one that's got to go home with me every night. You ain't the one that's got to live in sorrow and sadness. You ain't the one that's got to deal with the stuff I got to deal with and fighting in my mind about how sorry and worthless and and, and whatever that I am. I fight my own mind all the time. The devil not just fighting me, but my own thoughts. I'm bombarded all the time. When you get to a place, when you stop worrying about what everybody else's thought and opinion about everything, you can go ahead and fulfill the, the forecast that God has for your life. You could have people that come along and say, oh, Brother Eric said, you know, you you used to run around the bars and you rough around the edges and you just got a rough way of handling things and you say things sometimes that come across abrasive and things like that. And you could let somebody say stuff like that to you and then you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then when you get alone and you're all by yourself and you start thinking, you know, well, I could probably do this for the Lord and you hear that in the back of your mind. So, you know, you probably better never try that because you could never do that because so-and-so told you that you got this problem and you rough around the edges and you probably ought to work in the background somewhere where you ain't got to deal with people. That's probably the best place for you to be. See, that's exactly how the devil works to talk to people. I'm just using that as an example. And Brother Eric don't get offended easy, so I know he can understand. You see, there's a lot of things that people are embracing, and the reason that they never let go and obey God is because of somebody else. Well, Aunt Frances told me, I don't care about Aunt Frances, honey. Aunt Frances and you ain't standing for the Lord together. You standing before God by yourself. You better know that you know what's best for you, what's best for your family, what's best for your wife, and what's best for your children. I've watched in-laws destroy marriages because a husband and wife trying to do the right thing, trying to follow the leading of the Lord, and some instigating in-law mama or whatever, or daddy or some, some cousin or something stepping in. Well, I don't think that's the right thing to do and bust up and mess up a whole marriage because somebody's got to run their mouth and somebody putting their nose and some ain't got a thing to do with them. There's a time you got to step up and say, this is what's best for my family. 
I'm going to tell you something. Whenever God called me to preach, that was some of my family that now love me. Amen. Want to hear me preach and that sort of thing. Who at the time probably thought some of that stuff was crazy. Some of them I heard rumors. Uh, they said, ain't no need in going to church all. He's just going fanatical. Stuff like that. Ain't no need to be dragging them kids all over the state preaching in all churches all over the place. That's uncalled for. They need to be settled somewhere. Blah, 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 blah. But you ain't raising my kids, ain't Sally. You ain't raising my kids, Uncle Fred. And this is what's best for my family. And if you don't like it, hit the altar and pray for me. I hope I'm preaching and helping somebody. I sure hope I'm helping somebody. Folk ain't going to understand it, but you've got to step out and do what's best and what's right for you. I've had many, many preachers I've talked to that they never preached and they never reached because somebody thought that wasn't their call. Well, that ain't for you. You ain't smart enough. You can't teach a Sunday school class. And yet, God can take a man like Aaron riding shotgun with Moses and Aaron's got a stuttering problem. He can't even hardly talk. God don't need you to be perfect. He needs you to be perfectly sold out. And when you get sincere and you're ready to do the will of God, God's got a forecast for you. I said, God's got a plan for you. Are you ready to walk in it? you ready to fulfill what God's got for you? There have been a many instrument players that never sang, never learned how to play because somebody said, oh, that ain't for you. You can't sing. Every time they started to raise their voice, all they could hear in the back of their mind, well, you can't sing. I don't mean that somebody was trying to hurt your feelings. Sometimes people say things and they ain't even thinking about it. But that will haunt you the rest of your life. That's all you can think about. That don't mean that you can't sing. Now, you might not be the best singer, but that don't mean you shouldn't try. My Bible said make a joyful noise in the Lord, even if you do it when everybody else is singing so nobody can hear you. Praise the Lord. Stand to your feet, if you will, all across the house. Hey, man, I know it's Thursday night, and y'all say you probably thinking, you trying to preach us like we're in a camp meeting or something. It's just Thursday night. We're ready to go home. We're tired. Let me tell you something. I'm preaching to you just like I would if I was in a crowd of 5,000 people tonight because I believe there's a lot of people that need to hear this message about my future forecast. If you're at home or you're somewhere, you're, you're listening to this, I know there's got to be somebody you know that could be blessed by it. I want you to share it with your friends and family, the audio, the video. Let somebody know that there's help, that God cares about what your future is. He has got a plan for you in place, just like he did for the Israelite people who were in Babylonian captivity. He said 70 years are going to come to pass. Sister Moran, you coming to the piano for me, honey? 70 years are going to come to pass. And at the end of that 70 years, he says, I'm going to do this thing. But before he concludes... He says, and you are going to seek me, you're going to follow after me, and, and then you're going to experience all this that I told you was going to. So you can't go down in the fight during the hardest part of the battle because at the end of this 70 years, I'm going to move. Are you at the end of 70 days, seven days? Are you at the end of a trial? Are you close by? Have you been going through it for a time? Have you been wondering to yourself, Lord, is it always, am I going to struggle like for the rest of my life like this? I mean, this is terrible. I don't understand this. Is this just a season? What you need to do is you need to submit to the will of God and say, Lord, if you're okay with this, help me to be okay with this. Give me the strength to bear through this because somehow or another you're going to pull me through this. I don't know how you're going to do it. But I'm going to start trying to hear from God so that I can follow the plan that God has for my life. I'm going to stop worrying about what everybody thinks about me. I'm going to stop worrying about people's influence on my life, about trying to influence me to do what they think I ought to do. Folks, I'm going to be honest with you. Whenever I got ready to come to Grace Street, I had called a couple of pastors I knew, just chatting with them. And one particular pastor I have a lot of confidence in. He's one of the greatest men I know. He told me, he said, well, Brother Myers, I don't know if that's the right thing for you to do whenever I told him that I might pastor Grace Street. And there is absolutely not even one little thousandth of an inch or, or smidgen of doubt in my mind that it was God's will for me to come pastor this church. I no doubt whatsoever now looking back. And I want to tell you something. If I'd have listened to him, I'd have never done God's will. you gotta, you got to find the will of God. you got to follow the will of God. And you got to do the will of God for you. Not for somebody else. Not because it makes somebody else happy. I'm going to close with this. But there's a reason I felt like saying this. 
God says, I have thoughts of peace for you. I, I have plans. I, I have thoughts of joy, of love. What does that mean, Pastor? He cares. He cares about your brokenness. He cares about your loneliness. He cares about your heartbreak. He cares. And here all this time, the devil's been telling you what he must not care. But I came tonight to tell you he does. Would you bow your heads tonight? There'll be some, maybe you feel... Maybe you feel convicted. Maybe the Lord spoke to you. I wouldn't let this moment pass me by. I'd get down on an altar and I'd pray. I don't care what you got to do. If you don't feel it, but you know you need to pray, get down and pray anyway. Find yourself a place right now. Maybe at home you're saying, Lord, I really need a breakthrough. I've been needing a breakthrough for a really long time. If this is my moment and this is my hour, I feel like you spoke to me. Honey, if that's you, get down and pray.